Good day viewers and uh, welcome to another episode of Reminiscences. Today I am uh, high up somewhere in Asokoro, at the home of uh, Cardinal John Olorofemi <laughs> Oneyakan. Thank you. Who, as you know, uh, has been the Archbishop of Abuja until he recently resigned. Retired. Or retired. Uh, the Cardinal wears many caps. I'll just try and mention a few of them to set uh, the ball rolling. Uh, he was the president of the Catholic Bishops' Conference of Nigeria. He was the president of Christian Association of Nigeria. He is still the co-chair of the Nigerian Interreligious Council, NIREC. And I think you all know that he has been active in the National Peace Committee, whose work has come with the elections, with the general election that is coming up in the next few weeks. Your Eminence, I'd like to welcome you to Reminiscences. And start by asking you about your early days in Kaba, where you were born. I know you started school in there. And then suddenly you moved to Aliade Lady. in Benue for secondary school, where I think the story begins. Everybody be began to know you. You set a record. Uh, I understand the record has still not been broken. We can talk about that later. <laughs> yes. yes. Thank you very much, uh, uh, my friend Yusuf. Uh, and I thank you for putting me on this uh, program. I know it's not everybody that you <laughs> go to interview for reminiscences. I presume you believe that I have... Uh, quite a lot to reminiscence about. And uh, only two days ago, I celebrated my 79th birthday. And uh, it dawned on me really that a lot of water has passed under the bridge as I look at those around me who came to celebrate with me. As you rightly said, I was born in, in Kaba, uh, which is a uh, it's one of the Yoruba, the, the northernmost Yoruba town. But in those days, it was part of uh, northern Nigeria. If, if those who recall, you remember, will recall that uh, uh, the, the northern Nigeria was divided into provinces. Mm. And one of the provinces was Kaba province. And that Kaba province coincides exactly good, geographically with what we now call Kogi State, which means my town, Kaba, had some kind of resonance with the early colonial uh, administrators who created these provinces and named one of them after our town of Kaba. It's a very, a very traditional town. Run, ruled by a king, which we call, we call the Obaru of Kaba, mm. and other paraphernalia of office. It is said jokingly that Kaba is a town where everybody is a chief. Mm. Where everybody becomes a chief. Uh, <clears throat> and if you are a chief in Kaba, you are called Oba. So they are, the whole place is full of Obas. Mm. Um, but I was born into a rather uh, simple family. My father was a, a farmer, he was not a rich man. He eventually ended up being able to buy a bicycle. Uh, but, but he was also highly regarded in the society. Somehow, he became the head of the community of Catholics in my town of Kaba. And he the position we call in Yoruba, Baba Egbe, meaning the father of the community. He was the Baba Egbe of the Catholic Church in Kaba, 
there, are, there were two main churches in Kaba at that time, Catholic Church and Anglican Church. He was the Baba Egbe of the Catholic Church. And in that capacity, he had uh, significant prestige. It was on that basis, too, that he was um, uh, a member of the Native Authority Court. <clears throat> I remember as a small child, I would sit between his legs in the court mm. while uh, the Obaro always was uh, presiding over the Native Authority Court. This was the situation in those days. So I always knew my father as somebody who had high respect. My mother, too, was a simple woman. Tra traditionally, they would have been considered noble people because my mother's, my mother's uh, grandfather was an Obaro of Kaba. My father's grandmother, father, grandmother, no, my father's mother was, is, was daughter of an Obaro. So we were all, in, in that, from that point of view, uh, we, would, we, could, we would have considered ourselves noble people, but we didn't take that seriously. It didn't make much of a, an impact then. What was important for me <coughs> was that my father was the head of the Catholic Church, which means the Catholic religion was very much uh, uh, imbued in me from the very early childhood. Yes. My father took me to primary school very early. I wanted to go to primary school early. In fact, <coughs> Uh, I, I, I disturbed him so much, he took me to school in January 1949. I got there and I was disqualified. Because, because you are five years old. Uh, uh, because my hand had, couldn't go around. Mm. My hand couldn't go around my head and touch my ears. And I really got very, very un unhappy going back home. But I disturbed him so much. And in the meantime, I got coaching from a friend nearby that in, Jul in June, uh, July, second term, he took me back to school and I was accepted. Primary school. Mm. Uh, it was called in those days primary one. Mm. So I was accepted in primary one in June 1949. By December 1949, I finished primary one and I was the best in the class. Moved on to primary two. And after primary two, we started what they call standard. Yeah, we got standard one to six. This was, uh, we, walked to the ch we walked to school. Nobody had a car. The, the school was the only school in the village. We, it's not like today where there are some children who go to special school, some children who go to beautiful schools, some children who go to just anything. Mm -hmm. Among us, it was all the same. We, we, we studied together, we played together. Now looking back, it turned out that those of us who were going to school in those days were actually uh, lucky. Mm. Because even at that time, the, the majority of children were not going to school in Kaba. I finished primary school in Kaba in 1956. Let me add that in 1956, when Queen Elizabeth visited Nigeria, I was among the little young boys that were drafted to go from Kaba to Kaduna to welcome the oh. queen. What did we do? We only went there. We rehearsed for two days in the sun so that when the queen happens to pass in front of us, we will wave the Union Jack. But we considered that a great honor. Mm. <laughs> so I went to, I was among the five or six of us chosen from Kaba to go to Kaduna to welcome the queen. That must be your first trip outside your... A major trip. <laughs> major trip mm. outside our, our area. Mm. It, at, that, at that time, my senior sister, Mary, was already in Queen of Apostles College in Kaduna, mm. which is now called Queen Amina College. Mm. It was already in Form, form 2 when we went there. Mm. <clears throat> and then I came back home. And I... During that 1956, something important happened. We did entrance examination. Mm. We had two, two entrance exams. The first was the common entrance examinations. And uh, as a result of that examination and the interviews, I was given admission to Government, Government College, Kefi, 
which was the desire of every young boy, not to lay in Kaba, but all over the northern Nigeria. Because it seemed, and it, now I realize that in those days, government college cafe was built for the, the children that were better. Yes, the best. The best, mm -hmm. yes. Whereas uh, there was the college in Zaria, also for the special children. Mm -hmm. I was told that the children of the Emias often ended up in Barua, Barewa mm -hmm. College. But in Kefi, it was the best boys from all around here. Mm -hmm. um, and in those days, Federal Government College, Kefi was totally free. Mm -hmm. um, then there was a second entrance exams. It was to the Catholic Secondary School. St. Michael. St. Michael's, a lady. And again, I passed, and I was given admission. Then I reported to my parent, my father, Daddy, I have got admission also to St. Michael's College, a lady. And then my father asked me, Good, you have done your part. Which of the two do you want to go to? I said, I remember very clearly the answer I gave to my father. I told him, I said, Daddy, if not because we have no money, I would have gone to St. Michael's. But since we are poor, I will go to Kefi. My father heard what I was saying. I said so because my senior sister I mentioned, Mary, was in Queen of Apostles College in Kaduna, and I saw the great effort, the, the problem it was causing my parents to put together the fees for my sister. Not even the full fees, fees though. She was supposed to pay just half of the fees. Mm. And even that, we couldn't put together. It was so bad. Mm. So I didn't want to add my own. That's where the direction of my life began mm. to take a course. Uh, when I replied like this to my father, he felt very sad. But he knew that I was telling the truth. Mm. We have no money. We would not have been able to pay any fees anywhere. Mm. So he told me to go and uh, uh, tell the Reverend Father. The Reverend Father was a white man. He was actually a Canadian. This was the principal of the school? Uh, no, no. The, the, head, the Reverend Father in my village. Okay, in the the village. parish priest mm. of the okay, village. Right. <laughs> parish priest of the village. Mm. His name is... Uh, his name is um, was Paul Emil uh, Paul Emil Champagne 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 was his name. Mm. So I went there. I told him, "Daddy says I should come and see you." And I think my dad had spoken with him already, mm. explaining the problem. Mm. Uh, here is a man who has a brilliant child who has passed all the extra examination, and who has a desire that he cannot meet. So it, it was there for the first time that the, my, our Reverend Father asked me, John, uh, what do you want to be where you will become adult? Now, looking back, it was the first time that kind of question was put to me. Mm. What will you want to make of your future life? Without thinking, I simply told him, I would like to be a Reverend Father. He looked at me. You want to be there, Father? I said, yes. Say, in that case, get ready. You will go to a lady. Then I went back to the, village, to the house and told my father, Daddy, Father says I should get ready for a lady. And then I related to my father the conversation between me and the parish priest. When I told my dad that I had told the priest that I want to become a reverend father, he jumped up from his chair. Did you tell him that? I said, yes. Now, I was feeling myself that maybe dad was angry with me mm. for even wanting to be a priest. Mm. But he then told me, I said, I hope you did not, I hope you, you didn't tell him that I told you to say so. I said, ah, oh, daddy, you didn't tell me to say so. His mind was that he didn't, he felt that maybe I was saying that. Mm. But no, it just came straight from my heart. So my dad said, okay. From that point, everything started. The, the, the fact was that I, was then, I then went to a lady, mm. and the, the parish supported me. Mm. They, well, before I was going, was give, they gave me even towels, mm. uh, whatever, singlets, 
everything. So the church sponsored you, uh, beginning from the uh, parish priest. Yes, well, yes. Uh, they sponsored me to go. Mm. <laughs> uh, I was not the only one, but there were other small boys too who were going to a lady mm. whom the par whom the bishop organized to carry in the pickup from the whole of Kaba province in those mm. days to a lady mm. because there was no, there were no regular transport. Yeah. So, but when we got to a lady, as it turned out, my my father didn't have to pay a cobble mm. in terms of fees. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you. So I was on scholarship yeah. for the six years that right I was there. in a lady. Did you ever regret the decision to forego the secular path for the priestly one? Because you said you just, you are asked uh, the question for the first time and you just given spontaneous answer. My brother, uh, I have several times had to say this, mm. that this desire to serve God mm. as a priest didn't start on that day. Mm. It had always been in my mind. Mm. Even my mother, and I remember only vaguely, remember my mother said, as mm. a small child, mm. children play around what they do. Mm. And I used to put a small, uh, put a small uh, box on the ground and go through the motions of what the Reverend Fathers do on mm. the altar. You were asking, yes. did I ever regret? Yes. Never. Never. They, was it always rosy? Oh, no. Mm. But I grew up then to know that when you put your head to do something, mm. especially to do something with God, you, you go through what it costs mm. to, get, to get it done. We had a, I had a nice time in the secondary school, mm. six years. Mm. I was always top of my class. Mm. Again, to my surprise, because I know that I wasn't working harder than everybody else. Mm. It just came, mm. always happened that way, which is how I ended up uh, with a school set at the time in the last, uh, the last year, 1962. Mm. Uh, in those days, uh, there was what they call uh, HSC entrance exams. Mm. By October, the result came out. And that is where the big story began. I turned out to be the best student in the whole North mm. on that particular exam mm. to HSC. Yeah. And of course, uh, the Northern authorities decided to display their best uh, <laughs> characters mm. by getting me a place in King's College, Lagos, which was perhaps the best college mm. uh, in Nigeria. Mm. There was HS in, Can in uh, Kefi, mm. Kefi Government College, mm. but uh, he, the, I, was, I was given admission to um, Government College, uh, sorry, King's, King's College, College, Lagos. Mm. We were three of us from our college mm. who did very well. Mm. And the three of us were given uh, admission to, Kef to, government college, to King's College, Lagos. But mm. you, you, you decided not to go. You decided to go to the... Seminary. Seminary. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's again, mm. more or less the same story re 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 repeating itself. Mm. That uh, I finished, finished with a, a very... By that time, the school search result was not out yet. Mm. But this particular uh, trans exam was at and admission, I was given admission to King's College, Lagos. By the way, I was to go and study uh, maths, physics, chemistry. Those were my best subjects. Mm. Mm. And, uh, but my mind came back to the original idea that I want to be a priest. Mm. So I went to the, this time I went to the bishop, not to the parish priest, mm. now to the bishop mm. to tell him, my Lord, I've, uh, I have finished secondary school. I have got uh, admission to King's College Lagos for HSC. Uh, and I, but I still want to be a priest. I might to go to King's College and then later, because it was possible to mm -hmm. finish with King's College, then change, your, change later to do the seminary. My bishop just told me without any hesitation, John, you want to be a priest? I said, yes. Then he said something that stayed with me till even till tomorrow. He said, John, you want to be a priest? From now on, I take all decisions for you. I said, thank you, sir. Mm. Thank you, Bishop. Then get ready to go to the seminary. That was in Ibadan. Ibadan. So I ended up in Ibadan. Mm. Meanwhile, they were calling my name in King's College, Lagos, <laughs> during assemblies. 
and my friends told, kept telling them, John is not coming home, he has got a seminary. He's nearby Ibadan. <laughs> <laughs> and it became a, the talk of town. Mm. That he, you got, it was, in those days, for a young man, a young boy to be admitted to King's College mm. and re rejecting King's College to go to seminary was considered rather unusual. Mm. But may I, let me say again to the viewers, mm. unusual do it may appear. Mm. For me, there was nothing unusual about it. Mm. It was simply my natural mm. decision. Mm. Mm. This was the time, that was the period when something happened that I have, a, whenever I have opportunity, I try to, um, to clarify. Mm. When I was waiting at home mm. to go to the seminary, at the end, uh, in around December, 1962, an emissary was sent from Kaduna mm. to Kaba. Mm. It was a gentleman dressed almost like you. Mm. Gentleman dressed with Agbada and cap. Mm. Uh, it, must, it looked like th those people in those days, they were calling them parliamentary secretaries. Mm. He was sent by the Sardana. The premier of the whole region. Yes. They knew about me. Mm. Uh, and they were all looking forward to... Mm. And uh, they said, this young man, so to come and find out, mm. go and find out. Why, is it, why is this boy not going to King's College? Mm. And the man came, landed at the DO's office, district officer. The DO sent a messenger to my father. They summoned my father to the DO's office. And they reached there and he was told that uh, uh, there's, a, there's a messenger from uh, Kaduna who wants to see your son. My father got scared. <laughs> <laughs> it will be scared. <laughs> he got scared. Yeah. But to show again the fact that my family was very close to church, mm. he, he went immediately to report to the Reverend Father that they have come to, from Kadunao to look for, maybe, maybe to <laughs> to look you. for John. <laughs> <laughs> and the Reverend Father told him, mm. send John to me and tell the gentleman from Kaduna to come and meet me in his father's house. And that's what happened. Mm. I went to father's house. To the parish priest's house. To the parish priest's house. Yes. And this guy came from uh, Kaduna. Mm. And uh, we were given a, a room where we sat down. Mm. Congratulated me that this, uh, the, the premier is very happy mm. with you. I said, I thank you. I said, I said, you did very well. I said, I thank God. He said, uh, so you are getting ready now to, to go to King's College to undo the North Proud? I said, I'm very sorry, I'm not going to King's College. Oh, you are not going to King's College? What's happening? I said, because I'm going to the major seminary in Ibadan. That's where I choose to go. I, kissed, I still remember the conversation like, mm. to, like right now. Mm. I said, ah, is that so? I said, yes. Uh, I said, um, why do you want to go to the seminary? I said, because I want to be a priest. Why do you want to be a priest? Mm. I said, because, no, I said, because I want to become a reverend father. Mm -hmm. Why do you want to be a reverend father? Mm -hmm. I said, because, and I was just answering naturally, mm -hmm. and I still remember everything. I said, because I want to serve my God. This gentleman kept quiet, looked at me. I was looking at him. I was getting scared. He said, what is he going to do now? And he repeated three times. Mm -hmm. You want to serve your God? Mm -hmm. I said, yes. After the third time, he said, God bless you, my son. He took his cap, put it on his head, mm. stood up, <laughs> and left. What report he gave to Sardano, I don't know. Mm. But all I know was that no, no more emir, emissaries were yeah. sent to me. <laughs> yeah. And you never had any contact with Sardano after no. that? No. Yeah. No direct personal contact yeah. with Sardano. Sometimes the story has been told with a bit of flowers. Mm -hmm. Which uh, That's what uh, I wanted to clear. I'm not in a position to <laughs> where some of the flowers are mi almost mythological. Yes. Uh, that Sadana himself went, took yeah. the car and drove the whole way to Kabalu. No, 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 no. Yeah, okay. No such thing okay. happened. It's good for setting the record. Yes. My seminary course was in two, po in two chunks. Mm. Uh, first two and a half years, I was in Ibadan. Mm. I did the course we call philosophy. Mm. It was while there that my bishop arranged for me to continue my course in Rome. Mm -hmm. And I went to Rome for four years mm -hmm. for theology where I completed my studies for mm -hmm. the priesthood. How was Rome then for you from uh, Fantastic. House in, in well, I was a young boy of 21 <laughs> mm -hmm. when I went to Rome, yes. 1965. Mm -hmm. 
uh, I was aware that some students were being sent to Rome. Some students had gone to Rome. Some mm. whom I knew had gone to Rome. Mm. So, but it was like uh, those who were very lucky mm. or those who were particular. So mm. when, it turned, when it turned out that I was one of those chosen mm. to go to Rome, I started to say, God, thank you. I said goodbye to my parents. Mm. And they were all very happy and very sad. Mm. Uh -huh. Sad because they were not going to see me. Not like today where people come home on holidays. Mm. We spent four years in Rome. You never came home. Wow. Uh -huh. uh, but for a young boy who wants to be priest, and we knew, I knew everything about Rome already mm. from my reading. Mm. Uh, I did a lot of Latin. Mm. So when I got to Rome, this teaching was done in Latin in the, semin in the university, and I followed the courses mm. in Latin. So it was not, uh, that was not unusual. Mm. But what was not... What, what was impressive was the wonderful things I saw in Rome. Mm. All those big, big monuments, mm. both uh, church monuments mm. and uh, uh, secular mm. monuments. Because mm. Rome is not only the headquarters of the Catholic Church, mm. it is also the, uh, the headquarters of the Roman Empire. Mm. Uh -huh. A Roman Empire with the Colosseum, mm. with the Roman Forum. Mm. And we used to go around to those places uh, during uh, just to, to visit mm. and get to understand uh, the whole history mm. of uh, Rome as a, as a, a pagan empire mm. and Rome as a center of the Catholic Church. Uh, so being in Rome already was an education. Mm. Mm. But did you feel discriminated against as a young black person? That's a wonderful thing with Rome. Mm. Actually, in the first place, the college, uh, uh, the college instead of college, we call it hostel. Mm. The hostel that I was in was made, was full of children, young boys like me from all over the world. Mm. So we met ourselves there. Mm. Black, Indians, mm. Chinese, mm. Uh, white boys, we're all there mm. as uh, Australians. Mm. We're all there as students. Mm. And we had all come from our different seminaries. Mm. I get the feeling too that most of us who landed there were also selected. Mm. So there was a, a generally high level, mm. not only of academic performance, mm. but also of, uh, uh, of uh, moral behavior. Mm. So it was a beautiful place mm. to be in. I kept finding myself doing very well. Mm without any special effort. Mm. So it was from there I realized that there's such a thing as God's gift. Mm. When God decides to give you his gift, he mm. gives it to you. Given the complexity of Elorim, Muslims, Christians, would you say this is a training ground for the later interreligious peace work you have done? Did you learn anything from that post it? Uh, yes and no. Mm. Uh, let me say no. No, because before I was posted to Elori, mm. I was already very much engaged in inter-religious uh, uh, dialogue. Mm. I was very much part of a group in uh, those days that we called Nigeria Association for the Study of Religions. Mm. This was an, a forum of university uh, lecturers, mm. those who were teaching in this, um, uh, departments of religious studies, mm. Islamic studies, and mm. so on. We will gather every year for the conference when we would discuss things. Mm. And at that time, we used to discuss in a very, very uh, civil and nice way. Mm. There was no topic that we could not talk about, mm. Christians and Muslims together. That was the first place I met Oloyede. He was a young okay. lecturer at mm. that time. Mm. But the person that really impressed me among my Muslim friends was a certain professor, I.B. Balogun. So Elori uh, did you... Then, the, no, the Elori the was good then. Mm. Because all this time, it was uh, interreligious dialogue on the, on the theoretical basis. Mm. When I got to Elori, I saw dialogue mm. in reality. Mm. I saw... Christians and Muslims uh, living together, mm. sometimes fighting, mm -hmm. most of the time just struggling to survive mm. in a difficult, Nigeria has always been a difficult environment. Mm. Mm. And uh, as a bishop in Ilori, I became naturally a leader in the Christian community. Mm. So whenever there are issues 
sometimes those issues are also provoked by government policies, mm. which knocks the head of Christians and Muslims mm. together. I have had the position of a leader among the Christians. Mm. For quite some time, I was the, I was the, 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 the chairman of the Christian Association, Khan, mm. Christian Association of Nigeria in uh, Kwara State mm. in those days. So uh, and during that time, therefore, I not only made academic friends who, had, who were then in the University of uh, Ilori, mm. but I also made friends with leaders of Islam in Ilori. The one I remember most is the Grand Cadi of Kwara State, mm. Alaji Oriire. Mm. Abdul Kadir. Abdul Kadir Oriire. Mm. God rest his soul. He has died now. Uh, nobody can accuse Abdul Oriire of not being a very uh, convinced Muslim. Mm. He was very convinced Muslim. But he also knows that the, the young bishop on Naiko is a very convinced Christian. Mm. <laughs> and so we got to talk mm. to each other. Mm. And I, I learned from him, and I hope he learned some things from me too, mm. that you don't have to sacrifice your conviction mm. in order to be able to speak like respectable and respecting individual with somebody of a different faith. We realized then too, it was clear to us then too, that much of the quarrels and the problems was caused by people who cannot, uh, are, not able to, are not able to tamper their emotions mm. with regard to religious issues. Mm. And we tried our best. To, uh, he was like a leader mm. of the Islamic group in Ilori. Tell us about your experience as the first uh, Archbishop of Abuja. Here you are in the nation's capital, yes. where power is at display. H how did you cope with that position? Yes, it was in 1990. I was already seven years Bishop in uh, Ilori, and the message came from Rome that the Holy Father had appointed me to Abuja. That, uh, my title then was Co-Adjutor Bishop of Abuja, mm. Co-Adjutor, mm. meaning a bishop who is sent to assist the bishop who is there, mm. and the bishop who was here at that time was Cardinal Ekandem. Mm. So I was appointed Co-Adjutor to Cardinal Ekandem, mm. but normally the Co-Adjutor is called Co-Adjutor with the right of succession. Mm. So a Co-Adjutor is appointed when a bishop is about to retire. Mm. So the coadjutor is more or less somebody there to understudy mm. the uh, incumbent archbishop. Mm. So that's how I came here in 1990. Uh, even my first year here, I was still looking after Ilori mm. with the title of apostolic administrator. Mm. But eventually I came here and settled. And uh, within two years, 1992, 93, the, the cardinal retired, like I have retired now. Mm. He retired, mm. and I became the substantive bishop of Ilori, I mean of uh, Abuja. Mm. Abuja was developing, building houses, building buildings, building um, uh, offices, and so on. But they were not building churches, mm. but they were Christians, mm. and they were Catholics mm. who needed churches. Mm. So we had to find a way, ways and means of uh, gathering enough uh, um, resources mm. to be able to keep up with the pace of development. Mm. That's how we started mm. from one parish to two parish to three to four to five. And the, the, the city was growing mm. every, every day. That was the major challenge of uh, Abuja. Mm. I also know, of course, that um, when our, the leaders of our church in Rome decided to send me here, Rome knew that this place was going to be something else. The time I was appointed here, it was like a, 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 like a yard, mm. building, building yard. Mm. But Rome knew that this place is going to be an important place mm. because it is going to be the federal car capital. Mm. So they wanted somebody there who could manage the affair. So I took it to mean that this is a special assignment. Mm. If I had any Christian Muslim concerns at all. It was not on the level of Abuja. Mm. It was more on the level of nation, yeah. national. That is where the question of Nairek okay. comes in. Yes.
But before we get to that, how about your relationship with government? Because, of course, this is the seat of government. Mm -hmm. And there have been instances when, much, much later, you criticize the government, or you are seen to be opposed to certain policies of government. Mm -hmm. I remember this incident about you preach where Obasanjo was there, I believe it's 2005, <laughs> where it became it must... as if you are opposed to the third term. Yes, third term, yes. Yeah. Yeah, but, I, but, I, but I put it nicely now, and I tell you, <laughs> Obasanjo doesn't want a third term. You pull up, pushing him, and talking nonsense. <laughs> you, you don't think putting it nicely would make, it, uh, <laughs> would make him happy? Yes, yes. Well, uh, on that level of relationship with government, you have mm -hmm. to distinguish uh, government in Abuja mm -hmm. and my, with myself and my as Archbishop of Abuja and the issues, concerns of the Catholic Church in Abuja and the church in Abuja and the government in Abuja. That would be not mainly with the FCT, mm. FCDA. Ma the major issues would be about getting land for schools, mm. for churches, mm. for hospitals uh -huh. and uh, uh, other issues that um, the policies of FCT here and there, some of them easy to handle, others difficult to handle. The higher level is that the level of government, because Abuja is also the seat of the federal government. Mm. That is where the federal government has policies which affects the whole country. Mm. And I happened at that time, therefore, at that time, I happened to be a, yes, a, an important Christian national leader. Mm. In fact, to the extent that at some point I was the president of the uh, Christian Association of Nigeria. That's right. So, which means that any issues with regard to the, any government policy at the, at the federal level that required response from the church, I had to be part of it. Mm -hmm. Most of my interventions were not really my personal opinion. Mm -hmm. They were more or less um, uh, giving voice to the position that the church has taken. Mm -hmm. Whether the church generally, including all other churches, or my own church in particular, the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. Don't forget, too, that we have this institution, very powerful institution, which we call the Catholic Bishops' Conference of Nigeria. Mm -hmm. We meet twice every year, and every, every session, the state of the nation was always an important uh, uh, point of uh, discussion. Mm -hmm. So from those meetings, we always came out with very clear communiques. I'm heard, I'm told that even the government people, they were always waited. Mm -hmm. What are the Catholic bishops going to say this time? But don't you think people see you as deliberately being a radical priest? I mean, because there's this tradition in the Catholic Church where you oppose power, you oppose corruption. Is it not a choice of making No, no, no. no it's not radical, but mm -hmm. it is opposing, opposing what is bad now. Mm -hmm. We cannot settle for what is bad. Mm -hmm. We cannot settle for what is bad. And you don't have to be radical to say no to what is bad. Mm. So whenever we have a government policy which we think is not fair on the people, we cannot keep quiet. We cannot but protest. We are not the only ones who are complaining. Other people are complaining. The only thing is that um, when the poor man who is hungry is crying that I'm hungry, nobody will hear him. But maybe when the Archbishop of Abuja Christ and say, people are hungry, maybe somebody will hear. What do you think uh, about the record of this government in terms of governance? Which government? Been, this current government. You've been very critical of it. Some people even Am I the only one hard. critical of this government? No, this one, um, <laughs> I don't think there's, there's any difficulty making up one's mind about this government now because we see the impact, we see the outcome. We see the outcome in the level of insecurity. So when we find that uh, corruption is still rampant and right down into the middle of the center of government. Is this under NAREC? Well, NAREC is, even just an, NAREC is just one group that tried to mm. do it. But I mean, the whole country mm. has been completely factionalized mm. because of the policies of government. And I think... The new people coming in, whoever becomes uh, our president, must realize that this will be his first job to please bring us back together. Do you think there is hope among the new people that are struggling to become our president? Uh, I'm a believer in God. 
<laughs> and that is why I have hope. Mm. That's why I have hope. Mm. Uh, the people who are presenting themselves, you know, there are many of them. Technically speaking, we forget that there are 18, of, 18 yes. people. Yes. Uh -huh. So we have a wide choice now. Mm. <laughs> and we, we know realistically. Uh, yeah, realistically, we are, we are probably, we are, we are probably, we now probably have to be thinking seriously about four of them yes. or so. Mm -hmm. But uh, the fact is that there is a choice mm. now among them. Everybody has, t everybody in terms of promises and analysis of our problem have been saying the same thing. Everybody has been saying the same thing. Everybody has agreed that things have not been going very well. And I'm very surprised that APC uh, candidate is also saying things have not been going well. But who is responsible for how things are? I hope he knows that. But then, this is a t civilized, this is a democratic dispensation. Um, it would have been, one would hope that, uh, one would have expected to hear, we have ruled for, we ruled for eight years, we have not done too well, we are not, we are going to change the way we are doing. No, but we are told, we are going to build on the old, <laughs> of where we are. Now, that is not very encouraging. Uh, in the same reason, and I'll be, I'll be frank here, I know I'm on, on air, mm. uh, even, the P, even the PDP, mm. it gives the impression that everything was paradise until Puhari came. Mm. But we were there now. Uh -uh, it's not long ago. We have not forgotten. Mm. If things were paradise, how would Buhari have come out in the first place? So PDP too need an act of contrition. Mm. They too, they too need to be, they need to be a little bit less arrogant mm. in terms of their capability to change things. Because when I hear APC and PDP all talking about experience, mm. this is a double-edged sword. Mm. What has your experience done to us? And the young people who have no jobs, who have who spent seven months in a, in a ASU strike, who are just looking for any opportunity to jump out of this country, they are not impressed with your experience. And, uh, and uh, those people ought to know that their experience is nothing to really boast about. Is the National Peace Committee then preparing itself for another crisis, really? Well, the National Peace Committee was set up because there was fear of crisis. Mm. And we have always been in that mood, mm. or mood of uh, preparing for crisis. Mm. Some people said that, that signing of peace accord is a waste of time. It's just a um, uh, ritual that mm. doesn't make sense. But many people think that it does make some sense. I believe it does make some sense. At least we challenge people. Whether they follow or agree or not is another matter. Do you have any fear about that? Uh, no, let me say I'm praying and hoping. <laughs> yes. I'm praying and mm. hoping. Mm. You know why I'm saying so, sir? Mm. It's because this is not the first election that INEC is conducting. They have conducted previous elections, and in my own personal assessment, some terrible things have been done mm. in the past. I mean, terrible things have been done in the past. Mm. Uh, 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 results have come out that surprise everybody. Mm. And uh, even now that we have a new element of uh, technology, mm. even that too has to be carefully examined and handled. Because we know that the fact that you are carrying some gadgets around does not mean that there will be no hanky-panky game. In fact, sometimes technology is the easiest way mm. to rig. But once if it's garbage in, mm. garbage out. Mm. I think, and I think I'm not the only one. Mm. Uh, we we could we should not be relying on only one person mm. to 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 uh, confirm the authenticity of all these gadgets. Mm. There ought to be a forum where other members, the opposition party, other, mem other stakeholders in the election can have their say. Mm -hmm. If there's too much malfunctioning in those electronic gadgets, mm -hmm. then somebody must be held responsible. Uh, we started with uh, your role in the church. Let me go back to that to round up. Uh, I know you are retired or from being the archbishop. Of course, you are cardinal and... As you reminded me recently, that that's a role that continues. Yes. Um, I'm curious about uh, a role you, you cardinals play. This is the choice of the Pope. All of us 
are fascinated yes. watching for the smoke. You were inside the room mm. where they lit the fire for the smoke to come out in 2013, I believe, for the yes, choice for of uh, Pope, Pope Francis. Francis. Yes. What, what happens? Can you let us in a little bit about what, 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 do, you, what do you cardinals do? I just see what we do, the, the procedure of uh, election of the Pope is not a secret. Mm. It is in, it's in, it's in public, public, it's public domain. There are book, books available that you can buy now to explain what, what happens. And before we enter the, the conclave, we know what's going to happen, the process that will t take place. The only thing that is uh, um, co purely confidential is who said what, who did what, so who voted who. Is it a debate on the candidates? No, no, there, there's not debate. There's okay. no debate. It's just the voting. You just vote. Just vote. And it's secret voting. The voting is purely secret. Mm. And it's secret in such a way that the only thing that we know is how many votes different people had. Mm. But you cannot, we, the, the system does not permit you to know who voted for whom. But you see, when, when the conclave is going on, journalists are very interested. Mm. They already have their list of papabilis, mm. they call them people who who can be Pope, mm. who are likely to be Pope. Mm. And they are already speculating, mm. this man will be the Pope, that mm. man will be the Pope, that will be the Pope. Then when the uh, final uh, resource comes out mm. and somebody's name is announced, mm. people begin to speculate how he came about. Mm. And that is when you have all kinds of funny stories coming out. They claim, some of them claim that uh, they have received their they have received their, uh, their information from an insider. Mm. But the only insider that we have is among ourselves. Mm. Uh -huh. Because nobody else is with us but the, but the cardinals themselves. They are not even young boys that go around carrying papers. No, no. We carry our own papers mm. around. It is a procedure that takes place in the Sistine Chapel. Mm. The very fact of the environment is a mm. chapel. Mm. Uh, it's a chapel. And one interesting thing about that chapel is that it has a big fresco, a painting mm -hmm. on the wall behind the altar. A painting of the last judgment mm -hmm. where the God will send some people to the right, to heaven, mm -hmm. the left, to hell. And it's, it's a scary reminder. Yeah, as you sit there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and and just to, uh, and uh, the, when we start voting mm. and we are seated, then they begin to call the cardinal by name, mm. one by one, starting from the most senior to the last one. The the role the uh, what do you call it? The precedence or seniority list mm. depends on how you were appointed cardinal, mm. not necessarily your age. Pa For each cardinal? Each cardinal. So everybody is qualified? Oh, that, okay. That's the one interesting thing with the conclave. It's an election in which everybody is a candidate. That's interesting. Everybody is a candidate. Mm. All of us who go in there, any of us could emerge a pope. We know that. Mm. That as we sit down there, we are looking at each other. Mm. So, <laughs> the, the, the one, somebody who is, wonders, the who is the next sheep to be slaughtered? Mm. <laughs> because being a pope is not a pleasant job. Oh, well, could be pleasant, but certainly not an easy job. <laughs> How come we never had an African pope? There is only because, speculation. Because we, we, have, we have only recently joined the club now. Mm. Don't forget, this Catholic church is 2,000 years old. Mm. <laughs> and 100 years ago, mm. there was not a single cardinal in Nigeria. Mm. The first cardinal in Nigeria was our Akandem, who has died. Mm, Arinzi. Akandem. Yeah, okay. The first bishop of yes. Abuja here. He was yes. the first cardinal mm. in, in Nigeria. Yes. He has died. Then Arinzi comes mm. next. Mm. And in the, last, in the last conclave of 2013, Arinzi couldn't vote mm. because he had turned 80. Mm. By the way, any cardinal who is 80, mm. the, after, if you have celebrated your 80th birthday, mm. the day after you cannot be in the conclave. Yeah, 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 done. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. This is a retirement. Done. Yes, it's retirement. Mm. So Carrizi was not at the last conclave, mm. but he was in the previous ones. Mm. Uh -huh. uh, there was Arinze, then after Arinze, Okoje. Mm. Okoje was in the last one. After mm. Okoje, my humble self, mm. and after me now, my young brother in uh, in uh, Oka, mm. that is uh, 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 Okpaleke. Mm. 
Kubaleke. So you have one now, year. Um, why? Uh, we can say that we have had African popes in the past, but long, long ago. Mm. And by African popes, we mean popes who came from the continent of Africa. Mm. And those popes we had, whom we call African popes, came from Northern Africa. Mm. Mm. They were also somehow um, dark colored. Maybe Arab. Well, what we call today Arabs, Arab, yes. Arab. Dark colored. Mm. Maghreb, yes. Mm. Uh, but black like me, mm. like you, mm. we have not had one yet. Mm. But we got close to it. Mm. In fact, the conclave that brought up Pope Benedict, who has just died, mm. there was so much talk about Arize. Yes. Because he had practically all that you expect mm. of uh, a pope, but mm. he didn't make it. Mm. And he was not there. So mm. I don't know whether he got many votes mm. or not. Yes. All I know was that he did not emerge as the pope. So you have one more year yourself as a possibility. Yes, uh, one more year after yeah. 80. Mm. Let, let, me, let me say that uh, as an outsider, when I, when I look at the senior priests like you, it seems there's a lot of sacrifice on your part, but there's also relative comfort. The church treats you very well. I've been to the house of senior mm -hmm. people, and I see that they live... They are taken care of very well. Is, is it deliberate to, 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 re, to remove the temptation of the outside world? Put it this way. God has provided enough to make everybody comfortable. When we have people who, don't, who are not able to get minimum of decent living, it's because there are other people who have too much, mm. who are consuming too much. Mm. Now, the church is a place where we don't allow anybody to consume too much. Mm. We try and give a decent standard of living. Mm. Even our reverend fathers, not the senior clergy, mm. even our reverend fathers, a young boy of 25, we have ordained him a priest. Mm. We want him to do his work. Mm. And he is working for the people. Mm. On Sunday, he's saying mass for about 1,000 people. They all put their little bit of collections, mm. and from it, he can live comfortably. Mm. Live comfortably if all he wants is to live comfortably. Mm. He has no big plans. Mm. He doesn't want to, he has no big investment to make, and if he, and he's not supposed to steal church money for anything. Yeah, he, doesn't have, he doesn't get married. So He's not married. You are not to think about the education of his children. Mm -hmm. If he has any problem, family problem, even the kind of family problems we have is members of our family. Sometimes when you have a priest and his parents are very old and, and very, 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 uh, uh, very poor. Mm -hmm. Well, our church allows assistance towards such people because after all, the church should reach out to the poor. If the poor happens to be the father of a, of a reverend father, why not? Mm -hmm. But we will not be able to, to build a beautiful big house in the village for your parents. No, there's no room for that. There's no room for that. But since we have a limited, modest demands, mm -hmm. it is, and we can, we can easily cover it mm -hmm. without uh, uh, going into unnecessary... Uh, um, unnecessary uh, expenses. Mm. What you said that um, is it to shield us mm. from uh, uh, temptation? temptation. Mm. In a way it is true. Like I was when I finished as Archbishop of Abuja I'm no, I was not afraid of my future. Mm. What was going to happen to me? Mm. In fact it was a group of friends who put their money together to build this house for me. Mm. So I have no fears of my future. So I don't have to be looking for oil blocks to, <laughs> and I'm sure those who are accumulating billions yeah. is not because of the future, because they have enough for hundred lives, mm. and they are still not enough, mm. not uh, satisfied. Mm. So that is life. So it's about contentment. Mm. Mm. And let's say is it exactly mm. that we need to be able to be contented with uh, what we need. Mm. Our prayer every day to God is give us this day our daily bread. Mm. Plus butter, if possible. Uh, well, you can <laughs> add butter. <laughs> but the whole point is that, yes. and, and, and is that we should pray to be able to just live decent life mm. day by day. <laughs> what, 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 do you, what, what comes to your mind when you see flamboyant... I'm sorry for them. For church leaders. 
Oh, church and leaders? I, yes. Well, I mean, uh, or, or, or yeah, those, owners of churches. Those people are not in uh, my own kind of church now. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, was talk, I thought we were talking about whom other people who are not even church leaders, mm. who are flamboyant. Of church yeah. leaders. Well, know, those people, they are, they are, some of them you say are even owners of their church. So they are the ones who determine to tell me how they live their own lives. Mm. I don't. I have no control over them. I can only live my own uh, my own life. Mm. When I see the way they do, all I can say is that that's not the way I see mm. that a church person in the church should be behaving. Mm. And uh, don't forget, those who are giving them money are also poor people mm. who go back home poor while they are fl living flamboyant life. Mm. It doesn't make sense yeah. to me. Some of them, too, are just using the church leader thing as camouflage for other, um, other financial uh, enterprises. Mm -hmm. We know that now. Uh -huh. So in a country like Nigeria, where laws are not very properly um, enforced, it is possible for people to get away with murder, mm -hmm. this, which is what I see mm -hmm. some of them are doing. Yes. So at 80, <coughs> um, how am I mean, you retired from active church work? How is day-to-day -day life for you? What do you, what do, you do? Beautiful. Mm. Beautiful. Uh, 79, sorry. I'll give you at an, 80, an extra yes. one. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. the, this whole, where I am now, start, started when I became 75. Mm. And I retired as mm. archbishop. Mm. I'm no longer having the headache of running the diocese. Mm. If a reverend father is sick, I'm not, it's not my problem. Mm. It's a kagama now who have to <laughs> take care. Mm. Uh, young people want to be reverend father, mm. training. How do you get money? I no longer have my headache. Mm. So <clears throat> I have a nice house. Mm. Uh, I do what I like to do, but I also know that my major occupation now is to prepare for paradise. Mm. Mm. I'm not the kind who is hoping to live for 100 years. Mm. Once I, if I reach 80, I have reached my, uh, the sum of my years, mm. and I would not ask God to keep me much longer. So how, one, how does one prepare for paradise so that we can all learn about it? You that? don't have to be 80 before you prepare for paradise yeah, I know. because paradise can come much earlier. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning, how, live, how do you prepare uh, yourself mentally? Well, yeah. no, you're talking of death then. Prepare myself not mm. only mentally but mm. spiritually above mm. all. Spiritually. Mm. Meaning you try and live a decent life. You try and uh, look back. You try and make sure that uh, every your daily, your daily uh, uh, relationship with your God is clean and smooth. That's how to prepare the way now. Mm. Uh, and <clears throat> uh, different people have different ideas of how they ought to please God and how to look, please your neighbor and so on. Preparation, of, preparation for paradise is a whole life program, I imagine. Like mm. I said, everybody should be preparing for paradise. Mm. But when you reach 70, 75, going on 80, you should know that it's around the corner. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Cardinal Onayakan. Uh, and uh, thank you viewers for staying with us on this very insightful discussion with a very revered religious leader. And until oh. we meet in another <coughs> issue of reminiscences, thank you and goodbye.